I see Tom's recording, so we are pleased to present Education Director Barbara Brown, and she is going to speak to us today about preserving our harvest. Barbara, you're up. Thank you for, for being willing to participate in cyberspace and educate and engage us virtually. Uh, well, we are all learning together. Okay, so one thing I wanted to say was that this presentation is available on our website under North Texas Gardening Presentations. So there are a, a number of slides that have a lot of detail on them. And you'll be, you can get those, you don't have to try and take notes. And we're recording this, so it will be available as a YouTube presentation. So let's get started. Why preserve food? I know that we are sharing produce from our gardens with the community gardens, but there may even still be stuff that you need to save and want to save for your own food in the winter cold months. Why? Uh, it tastes better. You feel really very accomplished, like you could have made it as a pioneer. You're reducing your ingestion of chemicals from pesticides and herbicides based on how you have dealt with your own garden. You can give presents for friends and family who will be impressed with your ability to do all of this. Helps the environment by requiring less fuel. Conventionally grown food travels an average of 1,494 miles to get to market. It's a lot. And you may need it. Supermarket supplies run out quickly in the event of an emergency, as we have experienced in some cases. Of course, you can't grow toilet paper, but you get the idea. The organization of the presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about when to harvest for preserving, and then we'll walk through three alternate ways of preserving food, freezing, drying, and canning. Which fruit should you think about putting up? We like local fruit, and Texas is really fortunate that there are many varieties of fruit that grow here locally in our state. When you're selecting a fruit that you're going to be preserving, uh, you want it to be ripe, undamaged, uniform in color. Vegetables, when selecting produce that is just ripe and unblemished. So we talk about ripe with fruit and just ripe with vegetables. Bigger is not better. So the uh, foot-long zucchini is not as good a choice as the one that's six inches long. Uh, wash and pat dry for 30 seconds. Note that the pesticides absorbed by a plant during growth will not be removed by washing. So if you're purchasing your produce for preservation, you might check on how it was raised. Here's some guidelines on the size that you would be looking for for preserving. Um, for example, you would like beets that are a half an inch to three inches in diameter. Uh, you'll notice squash four to six inches is suggested. Um, cucumbers five to six inches and shorter if you're making pickles. Uh, just as a, an offhand comment, there is a difference between slicing cucumbers and pickling cucumbers. And pickling cucumbers have a thinner skin and so they're better able to absorb the brine that, that you're creating the pickles in. Harvesting herbs. Uh, Annuals, you can harvest up to 75% of the growth, and perennials, about a third of the leaf growth. Note that herbs are more flavorful when they're picked in the morning, just after the dew has dried, rather than in the hot afternoon sun when the plant is closing its leaves to protect its, its moisture. Herbs grown for their foliage should be harvested before they flower. 
because when the the plant flowers and i'm thinking specifically of basil the plant is saying okay my life is almost over and it's going to be putting all of its energy into producing seeds that can cause the leaves to have slightly an off flavor so clip off the the flowering part and stop harvesting your perennials about a month before first frost which is toward the end of november Couple of suggestions on what to do with your herbs. Uh, you can preserve them in oil or butter. Uh, wash them, pat dry or spin dry. Place the herbs in the food processor, third of a cup of oil for two cups of leaves, or half a cup of unsalted butter for two to four tablespoons of leaves. Sometimes you might want to add citrus, ginger, or garlic for your butter, it, it makes the flavor more complex. Process with your food processor, scraping the inside of the bowl until you have a paste. Package cup of herb oil or half cup of buttered herb in a Ziploc bag, or you can put it in a jar. Uh, seal, store in the refrigerator for a week or freeze for up to six months. And then we have herb vinegar. This makes a, a nice decorative present uh, for somebody. Wash and pat dry your herbs. You're gonna put the herb in a bottle and you're gonna add a small amount of salt or pepper uh, if you wanna add a stronger flavor. Cover with a high quality vinegar rather than using distilled vinegar uh, because you're gonna be using this in a small quantity uh, for salad dressings or to splash onto uh, vegetables, so wine, champagne, rice vinegar, the high quality vinegar. Store in a cool dark place and, and just shake it every couple of days to make sure that the, the leaves are releasing their essential oils. Check it in about a week, uh, see what the taste is like, then you can store it longer until you get a stronger taste if you want. When you're finished with this part of it, you strain the vinegar out and that's what you're going to say, not the herbs that were in there. Although for decorative purposes, you can choose to add one or two fresh leaves into the vinegar, just, but that's for show. Label the jar. Uh, freezing. If we're talking about freezing fruits, the easiest way that I found is to just put them on a cookie sheet uh, leaving some space between them. Freeze it for about 24 hours at zero degrees and then just pop them out of the tray that you have been freezing them on. Pack them into uh, plastic bags or rigid containers and keep them in the freezer. Uh, this is easy to do. You really don't need much special equipment. Uh, and it does a good job of maintaining the nutritive value. Some fruits may discolor in the freezing process. So we're going to take a look. When you're freezing vegetables, these are the advantages. You do need a, a pot. And the best vegetables for freezing are generally those that are cooked before serving, like green beans, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots, cauliflower, corn. We're going to talk a little bit more about tomatoes later because that's such a popular crop. You will need a pot for parboiling, or you can use a pot and a colander, clean storage containers, and labels. You will hear me say labels several times. It is amazing how things lose their recognizable appearance after some of the processing. Just saying. So preparing vegetables for freezing, we talked about you're going to wash them, cut them into uniform size pieces. And that's, uh, it really works better if they are about the same size, both for storage and for the rest of your processing. For some vegetables, I use a mandolin to get my slices equal sized. 
And that is fast and efficient, but it is also potentially dangerous. So if you're gonna use a mandolin, use the protective safety handle and be very careful and pay close attention. At least one of my emergency room visits related to a mandolin. So your blanching pot. The reason you're blanching is to slow and stop the action of enzymes, which causes deterioration. But it also will give you a brighter color in the vegetables that you're freezing and retards the loss of vitamins. Approximate blanching times generally are just a few minutes. You're not cooking them. You are just getting the surface hot. Uh, the exception you'll see to that are beets that uh, have a, a longer processing time. So here's the steps. So first you're going to steam them or boil them. Immediately after the time has passed, you're gonna put that container into an ice bath. You're not cooking them. All you want to do is get them the surface hot and then you wanna cool it as fast as possible. And then put them in the bags or containers and label. Tomatoes are the most frequently grown vegetable as we are, we covet, we love. And in good gardening years, you may have more tomatoes at one time, particularly if you happen to be growing determinants that produce all of their crop in a couple of weeks. Tomatoes preserve really well in the freezer. You can do them by themselves or you can add various herbs to have a ready-made spaghetti sauce or salsa. Thick skinned tomatoes should be skinned or peeled before freezing. With thin skinned tomatoes, you can kind of get by with not doing that. How to freeze tomatoes? Firm, ripe, deep red in color or a correct color for the variety. And we're gonna talk about to do them raw, wash and dip, this is how to, to peel them. In boiling water for 30 seconds to loosen the skin. You can freeze them whole, you can cut them into pieces. Uh, if you're putting them into containers and particularly if they're glass containers, but really any container, Remember to leave an inch of headspace because tomatoes have a lot of water content and that's going to expand during freezing. You can also choose to put up tomato juice by running your tomatoes through a sieve. It's a good idea to add a little bit of salt to that and don't forget the headspace. You can cook your tomatoes and then freeze the resulting product. Uh, usually 10 to 20 minutes is enough for cooking them. And I just mentioned you can find seasoning packets or you can use herbs from your own garden. Freezing herbs in water. Uh, wash and pat dry. Uh, and the patting dry is, is really helpful here, but what you're gonna do is at least what I have done that's pretty easy is I just put the minced up herbs into an ice cube tray, add purified water. Uh, our, the water that comes from our tap often has a lot of chemicals in it. So if you've got a purifier or you can use distilled water, it will keep you from putting that flavor into your herbs. Once they're frozen, you just pop them out of that ice cube tray, put them in a freezer bag, and label the bag. And it's particularly important with herbs because minced green herbs look the same, all of them. Good herbs for freezing, basil, chives, dill, lemon balm, lemongrass, mint, oregano, parsley, sage, savory, tarragon, and thyme. I'm sure there's a Simon and Garfunkel song in there somewhere. Drying. Drying is another way to preserve the produce from our garden. It makes a healthy, when you're making fruit, it makes a healthy snack. You can sort of substitute for <clears throat> other unhealthy snacks. Uh, you can also mix it into your granola, your trail mix. 
Drying fruit retains most of the vitamins and minerals. And although it's kind of a charming idea to uh, dehydrate foods outside in the sun, <coughs> excuse me, that is not recommended for North Texas because of our humidity. Select fresh, fully ripened fruit, which has a higher sugar content than immature fruit. If drying the skins on, wash them. Uh, for some, those of <clears throat> that have really thick skins like cherries, you may want to crack that skin. <coughs> Okay, sorry, allergies. I'm going, to take, I'm going to interrupt for a second and take a throat lozenge. Okay. Sure thing. Take all the time you need, Barbara. Okay, I think we're okay. We'll see. Uh, because fruit sometimes discolored, you can pre-treat it with ascorbic acid. Sulfites are no longer approved for pre-treating fruit from browning or killing bacteria. Drying fruit. Arrange on drying trays in single layers, fit cavity up. You're gonna be drying at 125 to 140 degrees. In the beginning of drying, you can use a slightly higher temperature, but as drying progresses, you'll want to decrease that. Testing for dryness. Dried fruit, as opposed to dried vegetables, should be leathery and pliable. So you can check that. And then if you have gotten to the leathery stage, you're gonna to move to what's called conditioning. And what you're doing in conditioning is putting it into a container, about two thirds full, Store it in a warm, dry, well-ventilated place. And you're gonna check it every couple of days. And if there are beads of moisture that form inside that container or on the surface of the fruit, then it's not dry enough and you need to take it back to the drying tray and then repeat conditioning. Once you have confirmed that you com successfully completed conditioning, uh, pack and store, a uh, cool dry place, could be the refrigerator, could be the freezer, uh, it can be in your pantry. Drying time for fruits a long time uh, because of the moisture content. So it's going to be somewhere, you might as well plan on a day at least that it's gonna be drying. Vegetables dry faster. One advantage of drying vegetables is that it takes, the finished product takes a whole lot less space if you have a lot of vegetables. So I've just, I've pulled this up. This is uh, 30 small tomatoes, 12 yellow squash, 25 roasted small tomatoes, and 18 roasted peppers. And you can see that's a pretty small amount of space. I do want to mention that <clears throat> although there are recommended well-researched ways to successfully freeze and can, home drying does not have firmly established procedures uh, based on, on research. So to dry vegetables, I said, you're gonna put them on the drying tray, leave room between the pieces. A dehydrator that has a circulating fan is a little bit more successful than ones that just use a light source. It's best, most flavorful, if you dry the vegetables as soon after harvest as possible. Uh, they're more flavorful, they've had less chance to, to do anything bad. During the first part, and this is what I was saying, you can have a slightly higher temperature at the beginning and then reduce it. Toward the end of the drying process, 
double check them. There is a fairly short window between perfectly dry and scorched. So here are the time frames recommended for vegetable dehydrating, uh, significantly less than for fruit. There are several ways that you can dry herbs. You can put them on a paper towel in the microwave, <clears throat> do it on high for a minute, and then check it. From then on, because there is such a short window between OK and destroyed, uh, you need to run a, at a few seconds and check it, run at a few seconds and check it. You can use the dehydrator. You'll note that you're using a temperature of 95 degrees rather than the higher temperatures that you used. Some ovens will give you a low enough setting that you can dry herbs, but most of them don't. And you can air dry them. And the only caution here is that it is better to dry them away from the light rather than indirect sunlight. Store in sealable plastic bag, remove air, and then put them away somewhere away from heat and light. Okay, water bath canning is the way that we <clears throat> can preserve fruits, pickles, jams, and jellies. And what you're seeing in this picture, uh, a big pot is one of the things that you're going to need for cooking the fruits and pickles that you're going to use, and particularly if you're making jams and jellies. This is a water bath canner. And what makes it a water bath canner, besides my saying it's a water bath canner, is that it's large enough, deep enough to hold pint or quart containers. But beyond that, it will have a rack on the bottom. And that rack keeps the jars from direct contact with the heat source. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other uh, equipment in a second. So jars, half pint, pint or quart are the most common sizes. <clears throat> the jars that are created for water bath canning are going to have glass that is thicker than uh, if you just tried to reuse the jar that the pickles came in from the supermarket. Uh, there are several brands, uh, mason jars, cur jars, that you can, can purchase. Uh, jars need to be sterilized before you use them, either in the sterilized cycle of your dishwasher or boiled in hot water for 10 minutes. Check the jar for any chips in the crabs. And the reason is that if there's a chip in the rim of the glass, that's going to keep it from forming a good seal. Lids and rings are also need to be sterilized before using uh, the same 10 minutes in boiling water. Uh, lids should only be used once and should not have any dents in them. Again, that will keep you from getting a good seal. You can reuse your rings, but double check them to make sure they're free of rust before you reuse them. The large pot that you're going to use for canning needs to have three inches of space above the top of the jars. An inch to two inches for the water and then another uh, space of an inch or two inches for the water when it begins boiling rapidly. Essential tools. The jar lifter is just the coolest thing in the world. You're putting jars into this big vat of boiling water. And the jar lifter just makes it magic. You just clip the jar and move it easily without ever touching it. It's wonderful. Uh, the <clears throat> magnetized tool is a it's just a stick that's got a magnet at the end, and that's what allows you to take the lids and the rings out of the boiling water without burning your hands. A large mouse funnel is really helpful because 
you're putting something very hot often into a narrow jar. And so that helps you do that. And finally, you've got the bubble popper. This is the spatula or that you stick down the side of the jar after you've filled it to remove air bubbles. Cool things that are nice to have. Uh, <clears throat> in the upper left, this is a special pot holder for handling hot jars. It's got a band in <clears throat> the middle that helps it give you pressure and your hand can slip in on the sides. The ladle is only is a good way is the way you're going to fill the jar but the advantage that this one offers is that it's got spouts on either side so if you happen to be left-handed and you have had this awkward experience of trying to fill jars backwards this helps you. When you're using a product that you have canned and you haven't used all of it, you want to remove that metal lid and you can have these little colorful plastic lids. Uh, this is a funnel that I like because it fits over the jar. And so that keeps uh, some of the mess from getting on the jar rim. And then we have this little lid holder. Okay. Uh, quickly, so we're going to talk about canning fruit, fresh, firm, wash thoroughly, peel if needed. These are the fruits that often will discolor as they're exposed to air. Peaches, apples, pears, apricots. And so the ascorbic acid helps prevent that discoloration. <clears throat> it's a teaspoon of ascorbic acid to a gallon of water. In the past, folks have used lemon juice or citric acid rather than ascorbic acid. Uh, it works, but it's not quite as effective. Uh, sugar helps canned fruit keep its shape, color, and flavor. So now we're going to look at two ways <clears throat> to, for the fruit. One is raw pack, and the other is, is hot pack. So in a raw pack, you're going to put the cold raw fruit into a clean glass canning jar. You're going to cover it with boiling hot syrup that you have previously fixed. <clears throat> pack the fruit as tightly into the jars as you can. Leave about a half an inch of head space for expansion. Your option is to hot pack. Now, hot pack, you're going to heat the fruit in the syrup or water or juice. The advantage that this provides, well, I'll get to that in a minute, sorry. Uh, the food that you put into the jar should be at or near boiling temperature when it's packed. And you're gonna process at a different temperature. So the advantage of hot packing is that it removes some of the air from the product. <coughs> the, Fresh uh, fruits have, and vegetables, but fruits mostly, have 10 to 30% more air. And what that does when you're creating your product is that air <clears throat> buoys up the product to the top of the jar and you have sort of the liquid at the bottom and what you're trying to produce at the top. So uh, hot packing prevent, helps prevent that. It is the preferred style of packing foods for uh, processing in a water bath. <clears throat> After filling the jars, remove the trap bubbles using that little spatula thing and wipe the jar rim <clears throat> with a clean, damp paper towel to remove food particles. A bent lid or the residual food particles are the two most frequent reasons that you fail to get a seal. So. Place the lids on the jars, <clears throat> screw down the metal band, and we're talking fingertip tight here, not as tight as it could possibly be. Uh, place it on the rack in the boiling water canner that's half filled with <clears throat> either 140 degree for raw pack or 170 degrees for hot pack. Add boiling water as needed to bring it an inch or two above the jar tops. Careful not to pour the boiling water directly onto the glass jars. 
Turn the heat on high until the water boils vigorously. Set the timer for the recommended processing time that will be in your recipe. Uh, it's almost always 10 to 12 minutes. Sometimes it goes as much as 25. Then you just cover and gently boil it until the time passes. Use that jar lifter to remove and place it on a rack or dry towel or newspaper. And the reason that you're doing that is, particularly if you've got a granite or a marble countertop, they tend to be cooler than the ambient temperature, and that's more of a shock to the jars. So you're just giving, you're putting the towel down to uh, protect them a little bit from that sudden change in temperature. Test the seal on the jar lids. If you look at a lid that hasn't been used, you'll see that it's got a raised bump in the middle of the lid, and you can push it up and down. <clears throat> when you place it and you have sealed it, there's no give when you push on that lid. If it gives, it means you did not get a good seal, and you're gonna need to reprocess. Label the jars and store in a cool, dark place for up to a year. Jams and jellies. Uh, jam, all these <clears throat> start with fruit, but they're made differently. So jam uses crushed fruit pulp. Jelly uses the juice. Conserve is made with two or more fruits. And marmalade is the transparent jelly, but with small pieces of the uh, fruit and peel suspended. <clears throat> add pectin, don't add pectin. Uh, pectin is what allows the juice to thicken. And some fruit has got enough natural pectin that you do not need to add it. Others do not. So if you look at the list, you'll see that the more sour ones <clears throat> tend to have enough pectin, the group one. Group two and three needs to have pectin added in order to get a, a good gel. Uh, liquid pectin is added after the fruit reaches a hard boil. Powdered pectin is added into the sugar before you combine it with the fruit. That's the only difference. So you've got your uh, half pint jars are generally recommended rather than pint jars for uh, jams and jellies. And you'll do the same <clears throat> processing and sterilizing. Wash and rinse the fruit. Do not soak. You, you don't want them absorbing more water. For <clears throat> use fully ripe fruit when making jelly products with added pectin. For recipes without pectin, use the just ripe fruit because that's one that has more pectin. Remove stems, you know, clean them up, get them ready and cut them into pieces before you start cooking them. Uh, don't use a blender or food processor to get the small pieces because that adds air and air is not what you want in your, your jams and jellies. Uh, so just finely chop or crush them. You can use a potato masher or finely chop. <clears throat> in small batches, it might be tempting if you have a whole lot of blueberries or things that you're putting in to double your recipe and so you don't have to spend as much time in the kitchen in the heat, but it's really best if you do one recipe at a time. Stir over low heat until the sugar dissolves and then boil rapidly for a clear finished product. As it begins to thicken, you're gonna be wanting to stir uh, frequently. Testing for doneness, what's called the gel stage. And this is, is where you're trying to get to. Uh, you can use a, a thermometer, uh, the InstaRead or Candy thermometers, one that allows uh, measuring a temperature up to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where you're trying to get to for a gel stage. <clears throat> you can also do a sheet test or a spoon test. And what's involved in the spoon test, the picture illustrates, but you take a cool metal spoon dip it in your boiling jelly mixture and raise it up and look how the drops fall off. A single drop 
is the beginning, and then you'll get a couple of drops as it cooks longer, gets hotter. When it has reached gel stage, the drops are going to flow together and it will sheet off of your spoon. And then there's the freezer test where you use a cold glass plate. You put some of the boiling mixture on that cold plate, run a spoon through it to make a line. And if the line you drew remains distinct, then it's done. I will confess that I have made several syrups for pancakes because I did not get to the full gel stage. <clears throat> the temperature test for me has been the most reliable for a gel stage. Preparing for storage. After you have brought the product, the fruit, to a boil, <clears throat> there'll be some foam on top of the, the fruit and you can just skim that off you can choose to add a quarter teaspoon of butter or margarine, and that helps a little bit with the foam. Doesn't completely reduce it. Fill the jars, pour the hot blue fruit mixture into the sterilized jars. Uh, they recommend a quarter inch. Uh, some also prefer a half inch of headspace. Process in the boiling water bath for the length of time specified in the recipe. Again, usually 10 to 12 minutes. <clears throat> Place on a towel. Be sure to wipe the rim before adding new lid. Oh, uh, if you find that you did not get a good seal <clears throat> and you're going to have to reprocess it, you want to use a new lid, not the one that didn't work, and wipe the jar rim again just to be safe. Cool undisturbed for at least 12 hours and then store in a cool dark place. You can pickle vegetables. That's why they're called pickles. And the best vegetables for pickling include asparagus, green beans, beets, carrots, cucumbers, okra, and peppers. <clears throat> Usually pickles include the addition of herbs and spices. And for pickling, you can use either cider vinegar or regular distilled vinegar. I strongly encourage you to check out the National Center for Food Preservation at the University of Georgia. They have literally hundreds of documents and recipes and it's uh, research-based uh, and tested. So for heating in the vinegar, you're gonna want a non-reactive pot. <clears throat> so that's like uh, enamel or stainless steel. We've got our water bath canner, we've got our sterilized jars, we've got our ceiling rings. Again, never reused lids. Vinegar, salt, water. Uh, again, I would strongly suggest if you can that you use distilled water or purified water. <clears throat> okay, this is the last two slides. So everything that we have talked about up to this point, I've done. I've learned lessons, I've had successes. That stops at this point. I have never used a, a pressure canner. I have a pressure canner, just never used it. So what I'm gonna tell you in the next two slides is really the information that I got from research. Uh, first of all, a pressure canner is not the same as a pressure cooker. So there is a very special piece of equipment called a pressure canner. The reason we pressure canned vegetables is that they are not acidic in the way that fruits are. And there's concern about the development of bacteria that isn't killed in a water bath canning process. So you need greater heat, greater pressure to make sure that you kill the bacteria. Uh, pressure canners can be large and, and quite heavy. Uh, they can hold up to 22 quarts of canned food and process at pressures of 25 pounds. Pressure canner will either have a dial gauge or a weighted gauge. Weighted gauges are usually designed to jiggle. It's, it's a sound that you hear. And to keep rocking gently to maintain correct pressure. The pressure canner can be checked 
to make sure that the dial pressure is reading correctly. And this link from the University of Minnesota tells you how to get that done. Before using it, <coughs> clean the gaskets and other parts. And note, <coughs> some glass top stoves cannot handle the weight of a pressure canner and they crack under that. That is now my ongoing excuse for why I'm not pressure canning. So what do you do? <clears throat> Put the rack and hot water into the canner. For hot pack foods, bring the water to 180 degrees. Be careful not to boil the water because you're not wanting to let the steam out. You're gonna wanna create pressure in there. Raw pack foods, bring the temperature to 140 degrees. Then you're gonna fill, place the filled jars on the rack inside the canner and fasten the lid securely. Leave the weight off the vent or open the pet pot. Turn the heat setting to its highest position. Heat until the water boils and steam is flowing freely either from the vent or the pet cock. While maintaining the high heat setting, let the steam flow for about 10 minutes. So you're exhausting it. After you've vented it, then you're gonna put the counterweight or the weighted gauge on the vent pipe or close the pet cock. The canner will then pressurize during the next three to 10 minutes. That's when you start timing. And it's usually about 45 minutes that you are running it through that process. There, so the last two slides that you can get downloaded are a set of resources and links to help you do this. That's it, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Barbara, that was absolutely jam packed with information. And I think we have a few questions. So um, pun absolutely intended. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> if anybody has questions, you're free to unmute yourself or just temporarily hold down the space bar to ask. And I will, um, Chat, chat as well. So somebody said, uh, how do I change that? And this is from somebody that's marked as owner. So owner, what, what were you asking? You said, Barbara, your knowledge is amazing. Thank you so much. Bad is me. How do I change that? Are you there? <clears throat> Hi, it's Beverly Duncan. Beverly! Oh, my God. Oh, Beverly! <laughs> Hey, hi, hi, hi. I cannot figure out how to just change my computer from me to Beverly Duncan. Oh. <laughs> we'll have we'll have to I'll see if I can help you with that. Go give me some thank else you. For research. And Barbie we'll says, later. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Barbie says wonderful presentation and thank you. And Carol says, Barbara, great presentation. When you mention dill, do you use the leaves or the seeds or both? Oh, good question. Uh, you can use both. They generally want the leaves uh, where there is a little bit uh, easier release of the flavors. The nasty trick that Mother Nature plays on us here in North Texas is that by the time you have your cucumbers to make pickles, the dill is a cold weather, cool weather herb, and it's gone. So we often resort to seeds. Good point. I've noticed when you were mentioned bolting, my cilantro bolted a while ago, and my basil has bolted now as well. I still have a few little side shoots on the basil that I can use, but it, it's kind of getting to that point where you said the flavor changes. Is it the Italian or Genovese basil? <clears throat> the big leaves. Big leaves. Okay, if you just cut off that flower, go down to a juncture and cut that off, your plant will add new leaves. Okay, great. Uh, oh, okay, I'm not doing this seed thing. So, um, and you know that the cilantro seeds are coriander. Yes, good reminder, thank you. Perfect. And Joanna asks in chat, when you have a glass top stove, is there countertop burners to use for canning? When you have a, a glass top stove. 
because uh, you don't have any problem doing water bath canning on your glass top stove. It's the pressure canner. And <clears throat> I don't know enough about the single burners to know if that would uh, work, but from the pictures that they had in the book, it would seem that that would be fine. It's the glass that's in danger of breaking. Gotcha. And then Pam had commented to Joanne, yes, you could buy a one burner portable unit too, if you wanted to do that. Uh, Liz, Liz asked, is this on the NTG website? Uh, yes, it's, it's down. If you go to the North Texas Gardening uh, section of the website and go down to presentations and handouts, uh, you'll find it under vegetables. Super. So I would ask a question. The only thing I have really done for preserving is just a slow drying in the oven. Like sometimes I'll put my tomatoes on there and just really slow dehydrate them and slowly dehydrate them and then maybe pack them in some oil or vinegar or that sort of thing. But what would you recommend for an easier process for a rookie? What would be one of the first one of the first things we could we could try to earn our stripes with preserving the harvest? Uh, for drying, I strongly recommend a dehydrator. <clears throat> uh, Freezing is by far the easiest, less, least expertise required method to, to preserve your harvest. Super, thank you. And Liz is saying, can anyone comment on preserving elderberries as far as syrup or jam? And anybody out there too, if you have any anything you'd oh, like to share. I have no experience with elderberries. Does anybody watching have elderberry experience? We'll have to we'll have to research that, Liz. Hmm. Anything else, you guys? Pat actually made wonderful elderberry syrup last year. Can you just can you hear me? Options. This is Leela. Can you hear me? Yes, Leela, we can. Um, I have preserved elderberries and I found the easiest way to do it is to, when you have a big droop of berries, um, wash them and pat them dry and then freeze the whole thing in, the, in a baggie. And then once it's frozen, the, the berries come off very easily. Otherwise, it's really tedious. But I've made uh, elderberry cordial and that has turned out great. That's from the flowers. And then also cough syrup from the berries and that's very good too. So it's very easy to preserve. Well, I'm excited to know that because I added an elderberry last year. And so it's still growing. It's um, getting bigger, but I'm looking forward to being able to do that maybe next year. Probably Thank so. You. Good. Thank you. Thanks, and, Lisa. Uh -huh. And Beverly, Tom said he can answer your question about how to change your screen name. If you put your mouse over the name, with your name which appears in the bottom left hand corner of your picture, of your video picture, if you right click, you get a little menu. It says unmute audio, stop video, chat, rename. If you hit rename, it allows you to type in a new name. Oh. Thank you, sir. I'll try that. Okay. So easy. Thank you so much, Tom. There's so many little uh -huh. hidden tips and tricks that we're still learning as we go along with this. Great. Takes Thank a while. You. Takes a while to pick up all this stuff. So if you want to add Beverly the Great and make that your name, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm bad. <laughs> bad Beverly. All right, you guys, anything else for Barbara? Well, Barbara, thank you so much. We appreciate that. So many wonderful comments and chat about all the knowledge. We appreciate you sharing it with us. And everybody, we would have 1.25 hours of volunteer service for the business meeting, if you were tuned into the business meeting earlier, and one hour for continuing education. 
the volunteer service for the business meeting can be recorded under CEA Hort exclusively authorized hours. And then our CE, and you could just put for the description, um, the June general meeting business or something like that, just to identify it. And then for CE, of course, you can put that under continuing education slash advanced training. And you can just put something to indicate that it was our June general meeting program, preserving the harvest. Um, and I think that is it for today. I thank you all for tuning in. Barbara, thank you again for your wonderful presentation. And I, I send you out to enjoy the good weather this afternoon. Y'all have a good day and we will see you next time. Bye, Catherine. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Catherine.